Very good. Yeah, thank you. It was a long time. I can't remember, I can't remember the precise way you the title. Yeah, that's, that's One is really algebraic geometry, and the other one is corpus geometry. And so, the picture I'll draw now is more tropical, or more, it's, a, it's a, an image for both. So I, I will construct an example where I have a, a point cycle. This is A1. It's just a point in, in the interior, meaning it's also explained what I mean by this. It's inside the algebraic torus of the torque variety. Then I'll consider this nine here. Um, that's my cycle A2. It also counts as being in the interior because it needs the interior. It's a line going through it. And then I will also have uh, a boundary cycle. I choose a point here in this boundary divisor, B1. I hope you understand this picture. It means that you need to be familiar with toric geometry a little bit. This is a moment polytope of the toric variety. And uh, so the strata here, the toric strata of the actual algebraic geometry. And when I draw this line here, there's a moment map sending an actual algebraic line to this dash line here. So I give myself a bunch of uh, strata and then also some numbers. So in this case, I have uh, A1, A2, and B1, and I have an S1, which I want 0, and an S2, which is 2. Okay. And uh, what I can do now is I can use those cycles to uh, confine uh, a count for ground bitten invariant or a curve count. Okay, so I can prescribe algebraic curves that go through those cycles. So what I'm looking at now is a genus zero curve that meets this point in the boundary, it meets this point in the middle, and it meets this line, and it meets the line with the psi squared condition. Okay, so uh, ground fitting theory you can impose these psi conditions, they're a bit like tangency conditions. Not quite, but roughly as a first estimate you can think of the requirement at, as being double tangent to this line. If you don't know what side are, that's the best guess you can make. Um, so this, there's these algebraic conditions, and you can ask yourself how many curves are there. Okay. It's a complicated problem. But I also need to tell the degree. So I said gene is zero, but the degree is also still something I need to fix. The degree. What we call delta. This is a multi-step of rays in the fan of the torque variety. Fan of x weighted um, by WE greater equal one. 
So for instance, in, in my example, I'll take this multiset. I take a, a ray in this direction, so that the fan for the stroke variety uh, for me would be, uh, let's see, the normal fan. It would have a ray like this, or like that. Okay, so this is the fan of the torque rank. You just take the inner normals, the fan. And then I need to say basically, if I want to count curves in this, how do these curves meet the boundary divisors? And usually, I write geometry a degree is just a number for in projective space, you have curves of degree 5 or whatever. In this refined uh, setting with torque varieties, the degree is sort of, they have a degree for each divisor. You tell them in how many points and in which contact orders do I meet my, my boundary divisors. So that's what this degree does. I, I say, you know, it meets this boundary divisor that corresponds to this ray um, with tangent contact order 2. And then it meets the one up, contact order 1, one down with contact order 1, and then the right one, contact order 2, and the other one's not at all. And if you make a arbitrary degrees, you might not have any curves that satisfy that because there's a condition, right? You can't just, you know, meet, I don't know, this with a certain order and nothing else that doesn't work. <coughs> um, but for this one, there exists a curve and it looks like this. So there's actually a, a solution to this problem. Um, that's a tropical curve. So yeah, so now this counting problem has, has um, two analogous um, situations. One is the algebraic problem. You can now study the moduli space of, of curves and that satisfy this and it's an intersection problem in the moduli space. And you get a number, you set up such that you actually get a finite number, so a finite number of curves, satisfying these conditions. And then in parallel, you can ask a similar question with this data in tropical geometry. And okay, that's what I'm telling you now about. So I can use the same uh, data here, points and a line, um, and look for tropical curves that meet that with the same data. And I'm now giving you one. So it looks as follows. My cycle A1 is just a point. So this, this, this is a solution curve, and it goes through that point. And then um, the boundary point means that I confine the ray to be in a certain subspace. This would be my cycle uh, B. So <coughs> this is B1. Give this A1 so far. So that, that just means that I can find the ray that goes to the south uh, to be in a certain subspace. And then I have this other line that has a prescribed direction of 1 minus 1. And uh, this sine number, uh, size squared, it just means, probably it's very simple. It's hard to take a little longer to explain much variety with the cycle line. But probably it's very simple, it just means that um, this incidence line is met with a vertex of higher valency. Okay? So normally when I meet something, like I meet that point here, the valency of the curve locally is 2. Okay? If it's just sitting on an edge, that's a generic situation that will happen. So the valency is 2. Here the valency is higher, it's in fact uh, 4. Okay? So it's 2 more than usual. And that means this curve satisfies the side class condition of order 2 here. So this here is a size square condition. This was cooked up by uh, Mikalki. He first suggested that the equivalent tropical geometry of an algebraic side class condition would be that the tropical curve meets the incidence condition with a higher valency. And what you can see is um, that this tropical curve with that incidence stuff does not move. Right? There's no way to move it. If I remove this condition, I could move this vertex out back and forth or whatever. So it can parallel translate, it can extend the compact edge. So you can easily see that the, the moduli of this tropical curve is 3. So the parallel translation into 2, the edge length would be another 1. Um, it does have genus 0, so it satisfies the problem. If I'm not mistaken, it's the only curve satisfying the problem. So um, now, why is this? Uh, Um, let me just give you this. 
So in order to get a finite count, you need to satisfy some dimension condition. The co-dimension of the AI cycles plus the co-dimension of the DI DI cycles plus some of these numbers that you have for the side powers. This must be equal to uh, the degree um, plus uh, the markings plus the dimension minus 3 or minus the genes. This is a very well known, this is well known to uh, to uh, co-written people. You know, this is just a number of total markings. And this is just the fact that you always see for the dimension of the modern space. And then this is just a bunch of conditions that you satisfy to get zero dimension. This is expected dimension, this is what you have to oppose to get zero dimension. And so this so it's just guaranteeing that you have a zero dimensional count, zero dimensional problem. And then the result here is um, <coughs> that's already the archive, uh, that you know when you count this tropical curve, um, tropical curve count. equals uh, the log of the graph. Log because we have the boundary log structure, meaning we have tangencies in the boundary. That's, that's the log stuff. So the relative problem that we there's a subtle difference between truly imposing contact order conditions, which we have the boundary, and we need points in the boundary, put the contact orders, and the side class condition, which we have in the interior. The log is really talking about the boundary. And then this is also a um, naive count, in fact. That means some people could say this COVID problem is enumerative. So the, the jargon. Meaning, uh, in particular, it's, uh, it's uh, non negative. Okay? These numbers are non negative. In general, you can get negative numbers, and these are not. Naive count means that the virtual fundamental class is equal to the fundamental class? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so for this example, uh, what do we get? Uh, example gives you equal to 4, 4 6. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but there's a way to compute it, and, and the point of my talk is sort of that this computed as. 2 times 3, and, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and the 2 comes from that vertex, and the 3 comes from the other one. Okay, so that's, that's what the talk's about, factoring <coughs> these numbers. Okay. So uh, hopefully, um, in a little bit, you'll be able to compute this yourself, <laughs> if, you wait, if you really want to. Um, <coughs> right. So why would you care? We can give a bit more motivation still. Um, there's various uh, aspects where this recently has um, become interested, interesting to people. One is uh, that these lockout elements compute scattering diagrams. So uh, if you were in Roger's talk this morning, there was uh, we had these red curves in this talk, um, which were tropicalization of disks. This is also what happens here. You can interpret these tropical curves as tropicalizations of actual holomorphic curves, just like in his talk. Um, and so in his talk, there was some wall when you cross such a disk. Um, same story gives you that. Um, scattering diagram, which is basically um, the, the rule how when two rays with some data come together and how they scatter out further rays, and this is all about making a, um, a commutator or wall crossing formula. I mean, this business is you know to do. Um, yeah, that's the next point. So scattering diagram was computed by that of the wall crossing. Um, so, for instance, uh, if you have two incoming rays and they have certain data to them, then 
the outcoming ray here is computed by a logarithmic drop hidden band um, where you look at the toric surface that has uh, three boundary components that are really just given by the fan by these rays, like one here, one there, one there. And uh, you have to do some balancing, of course. But that, that's given by a lot of hidden number, so they're useful for that. Then, um, furthermore, we play a central role. in the programs of uh, gross hacking field and gross Eva. So what is this about? Mm, it's a construction of neurons. So the most recent approach is that you just start with a, with a log calabial. Uh, it can either be a semi-simple calabial or it can be smooth space with a log canonical divisor and a canonical divisor. And then you do logarithmic log theory of this variety and Cook up from that of a rhythmic theory a ring, and take the spectrum of that ring in that same row. It's a very appealing procedure. And that crucially uses log of events. It's uh, quite important for that. Um, and then, yeah, you, you can also think of this as some alternative to symplectic cohomology. So that this is sort of a version of symplectic cohomology in algebraic geometry. Um, then, tropical uh, counts have some field independent information. Um, what do I mean by that? Mm, there's something called a blocker gender. Eh? Classically back to so called defined severity degrees. And this is like a quantum count. <coughs> um, doesn't really exist yet in Grom Witten theory, but there should be some quantum Grom Witten theory. But in Trump geometry, it's, it's very, very simple. First, and uh, we also call them cuneiform multiplicities or invariants. Um, if you count rational qubits, qubits of genus zero through uh, how many eight points? In P2, okay. uh, nice profit number, one of it's 12. It's 12. Because if you have, have a pencil of cubics, right, most of them are elliptic curves, and then there's 12 rational ones. Um, like it's a typical example for constructing an elliptic surface. Um, then if you do that count um, Q deformed, Q count has the result Q plus 10 plus Q inverse. So the Q deformed answer to that count. And now if you if you actually set Q to 1, you get 12. That's what I just said. There's 12 rational curves in the cubic pencil. And if you then instead put Q equal to minus 1, then you get 8. And this is the so-called Welsh inverse end. There we go. That's, that's all the real count. Okay? And the point is that you can obtain this Q count from the tropical curve count. When you count tropical curves, you can cook up, cook up this uh, Laurent polynomial. And this knows about the complex count and the real count. 
So I mean by there's some field independent information in front of the job. Okay. <coughs> and yeah, to cook up this number, I'll tell you in a little bit. Um, you need the factoring of the multiplicity as well visible the vertices. Okay? That's what this talks about once more. Um, you want to factor the multiplicity n as a product of the vertices, which in general is also not possible, I'll tell you that too. And if you can, then you can make this cuneiform thing. Okay. Finally, uh, another motivation, personal, it's a joint work with Check Your Muck, who gave a talk two days ago. Um, that this tropical multiplicity, oh yeah, so you can look at the following. We, we run a, a construction where we take tropical lines in uh, R3, meeting four tropical quintics, quintic curves, and these, from those, and there's um, 575 of them with multiplicity. From those, we cook up a Lagrangian spherical objects. objects in the mirror printed. And it's very interesting that even just from lines, which are derived geometrically, are very stupid, um, really degree one lines, so like, you get very interesting advantages. It's very surprising. Um, I don't really know why, but uh, you can ask Czech, we have knows the zoo of those things. Uh, we believe, for instance, that we can get the quantum homologous here as a mirror dual object in such a line. And what we observed was that the tropical multiplicity of a line equals the, the size of H1 of the Lagrangian that you construct from the line. Okay. That's another reason why you what might be interested in those proper, proper multiplicity. Okay, so hopefully uh, enough motivation for you to maybe uh, look at this rather boring definition now. So what is it? So do you get a unique Lagrangian for every tropical line? I mean, you get a different uh, for all 575 yes. lines. Um, the thing is, the lines, it's in the generic situation, you will get 575 lines, and you get a unique Lagrangian for all of them. And uh, I believe these are all boring, right? They are just Lagrangian, they're just three spheres. Uh, yeah, in, in the in Zimbra's case, there are lots of But I think we can, we can get more than one Lagrangian for each optical uh, the projection are all uh, similar. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is you can, um, you can move your tropical quintics, which means that you move in the moduli space of mirror quintics. Mirror quintics have a huge Taylor moduli space. And if you go to some other mirror quintics, you know, these lines change to become more interesting in the lines. And you get all kinds of exotic things. Um, which currently is still in the mode of you know, figuring out what exactly all we can get with this. Just from the numerical data, there's um, really uh, all kinds of things showing up. Um, so, given the tropical curve, gamma, um, we produce. Oh yeah, given the curve and all this incident stuff, so some um, spaces that it's supposed to meet, and some side numbers and so forth. We took up a, a map of lattices, where the first is just the product of the ambient lattice, n is uh, z to the d, which is the dimension of the protective program we started with, um, and m will be the dual layer on. Uh, on And for each vertex, uh, I just take a copy of n. Oops. So uh, this is usual Tory geometry language, right? So n is uh, n is the character lattice, and n is the co-character lattice. 
And now uh, I take a map to a different lattice, which is the same rank though. And here I go over all the edges of the top of the curve. So this means the compact edges. And here I take n modulo uh, a primitive vector that is parallel to the edge. So if this is my top of the curve, then this is a compact edge here. I'll take a vector ue that is uh, primitive and either points that way or the other way. It's parallel to the edge. Okay. Mod out that one. Um, then I take the sum width uh, product of all the i's. So I take n modulo this ai instead of condition. And here I take the lattice uh, that spans the tangent space of that incidence condition. So incidence condition, locally by the curve, the incidence condition might not be um, a linear space, it can be at any cycle, but where the curve meets it, there is some linear space, that tangent space at the point, and I take the integral lattice for that. And then I take also for the boundary conditions, and j. Again, the integral version. So uh, in the example, a1 was just, uh, a1z was just this space, but a2 is everything, or? That's right. Uh, no, 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 um, a2 is really just a point, so I'm not at a point here, which makes it really, yeah, maybe that's not the example. Uh, okay. So this is for this vertex here, and this is for that vertex there. 
and now phi um, takes the difference of those two um, vertex uh, vectors, so it's like a, an element here and an element here, take the difference and project it to um, all this here m1 or n1 n2 and then you go to n1 minus n2 mod ub okay so ub would be this vector here this is ub oh in fact uh, this has a morphology too so this vector is in fact ub is equal to uh, 2 1 Um, Why is that? Because I, did, I gave my degree to look back. I defined the degree to be two there, one there, one there, and two there. Yeah, if I didn't do that, the two here, there would be no curve satisfying it. Because by balancing it, you have because of having two vectors going out here. You need to have that. Um, so that's the first summand on the right hand side. Just do that. And then. Uh, for the point, um, I really do just map. Um, well, yeah, technically speaking, I should have an extra vertex here for the point. Uh, that's why right. yeah, I need to do that. So um, the mark, the markings also count as vertices. So there's another point here, and you map that one to just uh, z2 modulo a1. A, A, A1z, but A1z is zero, so you can just leave it just to get about that. This is just an isomorphism. So it doesn't add to the doesn't add to the to the rank uh, or to the index anything. That's for this point here. And this factor is the A1 part. Then you have the A2 part. So here you map um, this vector modulo uh, A2. So you do that modulo. The line direction, which is just uh, one minus one times okay. So you project that onto that, and then finally you have the b direction. So here you can project that vertex modulo uh, the b direction. So that is n two modulo um, b one, which is just uh, 0 minus 1. Okay? So now this enables you, if you be more diligent than I am, uh, to compute this multiplicity. But I'll find a cooler way to do it. When you do that, you see a bit of a game of how you might be able to split it up in vertices, right? So that's sort of the idea that we want to mention that you should get a 3 from here. So this would be some contribution from just 3 here and a 2 there. But for that, of course, you have this map analysis. You have to split it or diagonalize it or block diagonalize it so that you get it something for vertex. vertex, 
how does that work? Mm. This doesn't quite work in our example because uh, we have a side class, but it does actually work for um, uh, for this the left vertex. Okay, so it doesn't work for that one, but it works for this one. Let me do that here. So if I look at such a vertex, um, here is weight two. This vector is two one. And this is zero minus one, and this one is. And the point is you have to take into these, so these, yeah, just a moment, this is minus 2, 0, considering the weight into the 2 layer. So now you are free to choose from the outgoing vectors, it's always trivalent, from the three outgoing vectors, we are free to choose two, and put them in the determinant. And it doesn't matter which two you choose, because of the balancing condition. You know, the balancing means that the sum of all three is 0. So we took, took another one, it's quite easy to see that the matrix you know, is just, uh, has the same rank. Um, so let's, let's just do that. For instance, uh, take this one and that one. So then it would be um, the determinant 2, 1, 0, minus 1. And that's actually 2. Okay. So we were able, using this recovery result, to compute the multiplicity at the left vertex to be 2. Um, and um, another example is, is this one. Okay, so here the vectors are 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. In this example, both vectors have multiplicity 2. Okay, just to get a feel for this. And uh, this example is interesting because this shows up in the, in the um, 12 rational curves. <coughs> uh, if you miss, example, this shows up in there. And now the quantum multiplicity. Definition is um, for n in n do uh, n q to find us the wrong polynomial to get from n over two minus q minus n over two modulo q to the half minus q to the minus half, which is the same as q to the n minus one half. Plus n to the fourth, plus q to the n minus one half. So uh, you can actually, you know, the, the numerator is divisible by the denominator. And then you get a wrong polynomial, you start here, and you get integral steps in the exponent from minus this thing to plus that one. Okay. What, are these, what is q geometrically? Um, 
there's a debate about it. Um, so one answer might be that it is um, at most it's clearly a volume. Um, if you ask, for instance, Johannes Nikes, he would say it's uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, volume. The uh, the upright line or something. Yeah, something like that. It's some some um, uh, so motivic integration volume, yeah, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what, what he would say it is. And um, if you ask me Kalki, he would say it's, uh, in effect, a symplectic volume. You integrate a, a symplectic, uh, with a whole more symplectic structure. You integrate that form over, over a disk, and then you get that key. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I'm probably closer to the Kalki thing, um, something that Travis and I also think about. Um, so you do this business, and let's do that not for that one, but for this curve, which I said told you would show up in the, in the, 12, the 12 rational cubics, then um, you get. Uh, because the multiplicity of each vertex is 2, if you do this determinant calculation, you get 2 and for both vertices because it's symmetric also. And then for the entire curve, you would get uh, that as the uh, multiplicity, the quantum guy. Okay. So you plug in this thing, and uh, you get, I, I do the right hand side here, you just do uh, 2 minus 1 is 1, minus a half plus q to a half, and that you have to the square, you compute that, you get q to the minus 1 plus 2 plus q. Okay. This is the quantum multiplicity of this particular tropical curve uh, in the middle. And now, uh, for the rational situation, uh, you get extra tropical curves that don't have higher multiplicities, and there's then uh, eight more. Okay, so then you get what I told you before, two plus ten plus q. Okay? That's how we can uh, compute the quantum multiplicity that I told you before with the problem of the rational. So yeah, this is, is uh, giving you another idea why it's useful to, multiple, to factor these multiplicities. Oh, there's probably only work in dimension two. Um, in dimension three, we tried a little bit with the pure form stuff. Uh, there's something going on, but it's not as easy to generalize. Okay. Now. non-integral exponents, but you know the insertion of one of my models will do something integral. So mm, one theorem that turns in that group, which I just tell you about and I'll write on the board is that you, um, in any dimension, if you're in genus zero, you can always factor multiplicities, um, even with phi classes, um, if you do a quotient where you do uh, vertex multiplicities over edge multiplicities. So there's a way to associate multiplicities with vertices and to edges, and then you do, you do such a quotient. Okay, so this always works in G0. That's a nice result about that. It's, um, it's still an entry, right? So it's just, you, you play with this uh, map lattices, it's a bit of linear algebra. Some thoughts in it, some combinatorial thoughts, but it's not, uh, it's too deep, not at all. 
And what I find a bit more interesting is that there's a counterexample, uh, which is this one. I, think, I don't think this is known to anyone. Because in fact, it already touches dimension two, the case where the copying work ended. We didn't do side classes. So this is a situation where I have a genus one curve. And I prescribe it to go through three lines. These are the dashed lines I'm drawing here. And each line is supposed to have a psi power one condition. That's why a vertex has to go through the line. Okay. Uh, so I spent 15 more minutes in preparation of the part. I could have thought about well, this is the only curve solving this. If it is the only one, it computes my log 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 theorem, right? There might be other ones though. Anyhow. Um, just this one has the uh, property. What you can do now, you can play with the line directions. You can make those um, any direction you like. You still have this curve there, with some exceptions, of course. So if I, if I make this line direction be given by a primitive vector AB, <coughs> and then this one by CD, and that one by EF, then if I compute the amount of my matrix, uh, Phi up there, then those numbers will enter it, right? And I compute the determinant for all AB. What I get is um, the index of phi is, which is basically multiplicity, because yeah, it is multiplicity, because we don't have any compact weight edges. And this is just point correction. It's an absolute value of. A D D plus F minus B E C plus D. E. Okay. Why is this interesting? Because if you were trying to factor this multiplicity over, over something like the product of vertices, um, it doesn't work. Each of those summit does have that property, because A is something that's associated to the vertex here. B, D is something so you have to vertex there, and E plus F is so you vertex over there. The first sum is perfectly factors. Second does two, but not everything, that's the entire thing. So it's a counter example, it's not possible to factor it over as a you know, product over vertices things. Um, but this is the best you can get, so the generalization that we also show is uh, in general, higher genus, what you have is an alternating sum of the vertex uh, factorizations. Okay? So is this example supposed to show that you can't get the Q numbers? Yes. At least not easily. Yeah. So, yes. Now what, what I think is cool, that's why I'm here, um, there's some relationship to not fully vector to this. On the forest. So the torus is now Tm, which is just n, and the C star. So this is the, not the toy, torus that we usually look at in toy geometry, it's the dual one. And then we define A to be the algebra of um, exterior powers of the tangent sheet of this torus, which is just. Um, the polynomial ring, the wrong polynomial ring in my lattice n, tensor it with the exterior algebra in the lattice n. Very simple thing. And now I define, and if anyone, anyone has seen this before, please tell me, because I don't think anyone has seen Look at that. It looks very simple. Now I define L infinity operations, or LK operations, for K greater than 1. And following way, mm -hmm. LK of Zn1 and omega 1, Znk and omega k. This is just uh, k many elements from this algebra is defined to be z to the n and the contract n 
the wedges of the bumming gas, where n is just the sum of the nk n. And this also coincides with uh, L1 applied to the product of the things. So product in this algebra now. Okay, so it's basically the, the higher LKs are all derived from L1 and the product. So I have a tropical curve and I have somewhere an incidence condition, either at an edge or at a vertex. And so this is either AI or EJ, but I'll call them AE. And because I'm also treating vertices as if they were edges, they are now contracted edges. Then I can form um, for the edge that this incidence condition is associated with, I can form an element of my algebra where um, omega, omega E defines A. So that means um, that or A, A Z in the version of it means that uh, if I, I contract the form to zero with an element n, if and only if n is in A Z. So you know, there's some vector space. I can take the perp of it. And I take a volume form of the perp of that. This is what omega e is. So it's, a, it's unique up to choice of the sign, plus or minus. And u is just a, the edge vector. So if my edge is an actual edge and I have a boundary in this condition, that's just this u e. If my edge, in fact, was a vertex and I'm in this situation, then I send u e to be 0, which makes this element the 1. Okay? The z to the 0 is 1 in that. <coughs> so to each incidence condition, kind of, I can associate an element in this um, algebra. And then what I also need to do in my, when I have a tropical curve, I need to choose a sink. Choose a vertex that is a sink vertex. Once you do that in the origin is zero, uh, you can you have a flow towards that sink. Because you need flow in the curve where everything goes to that sink, ignoring your edges. And now I can start with the unbounded edges where I might have some incidence conditions, AE1 and AD2. Okay. And I, I now bracket them with the L infinity structure to get the incidence condition on this one. Okay. So what I do is I put here um, the A element for that edge is just 
L2 of A1, A2, okay? and so forth. So if you have higher value vertices, it also works. Higher value vertices, guys, because when your side classes, you necessarily have higher value vertices. You can still do that. You bracket them together. You have a higher LK operation. And then you, know, you bracket them all together until you're in the same vertex. And then the theorem is that uh, the multiplicity of the top curve is um, the pairing of a volume form with the product of all the A's of the thing at the sink. Okay, so E contains the same. And omega is just a primitive element of um, of the top uh, top M this dimension. Okay, so it's a generator for that. Uh, okay, so once more, you take instance conditions. Um, if there are vertex instance conditions, then now we have an edge also for that vertex instance condition. If it's an additional thing that flows into the vertex, you just bracket stuff together and walk to the sink with the flow. And at the end, so you have then a bunch of um, elements in your, in your algebra for the adjacent ed edges in the sink. You just multiply them. No bracket, just multiply, and then pair with the boolean form. And then up to sine, that gives you an integer. And that's a multiple interval curve. Okay? Pretty fancy way of computing. So again, why would you pair? Said this thing is a null infinity structure, that was a bit of a lie. Um, because what we're through is set A0 to be the kernel of L1, which is the same as all elements Zn tensor omega with the property that contraction of omega by n is zero. It's a sub algebra. And note that all the operations for the multiplicity computation uh, we stay in this. Okay? You don't need the bigger one. You work in time with something. Um, because <coughs> you look here, when I make up this guy, omega actually contracts to zero under this U. So this actually all lies in the sub -order. Um, and then the statement is that um, that when you restrict the LK operation <coughs> to this A naught, then they make it make A naught into an L infinity. Into infinity. And <coughs> in fact, it is strict, uh, meaning. <coughs> that it's also the algebra. It is a the algebra. Um, generally, you know, the algebraic idea is a generalization of the algebra. This is, in fact, also the algebra. Mm, and there's more cool stuff about it. For instance, um, I mean, this, this is sort of the same statement. L2 restricted to A. Nor is the uh, the shooting shooting near infinite boost bracket bracket. So you know on the polyvector fields you have a natural bracket. That's the same thing as L two on A zero. L3 
has to do with law process. You know, when you move your incidence conditions a little bit, so the incidence conditions are truly affine constraints, right? You can parallel translate, parallel translate line, for instance. And if you wiggle them a little bit, the curve remains the same. <coughs> Remember my initial example here, so that would look like that. If I move this point, the curve follows. You can, it's still there. I move the incidence here, I move the line incidence, there's still a curve. But if you move them more, uh, you get more crossing phenomena. You know, um, the, the curve doesn't, for instance, if this edge is forced to contract to zero, then this curve doesn't exist anymore as a solution to the structural problem. But there will be other curves. And the morphism will always, if you sum all the morphism of all curves, only remain constant because it is a Lockham Fitterman. And Lockham Fitterman remains constant under those, such operations. Okay? So when you do these deformation things, uh, it turns out that the Jacobi identity. Um, is equivalent to the L3 thing. So this means now, um, you know, imagine that I'm, I'm in the space where I move my incidence conditions and I hit a situation where this curve just appears to exist. Then there's sort of a wall there. And at the other side of the wall, there are other curves that, you know, have to exist to, to give the same row hidden count. And just put in all these the curves, and typically the situation is you have one curve on one side of the wall, you have two on the other side of the wall. And you plug them in this L3, all of these curves. And, you know, the, the curves give you different ways of multiplication in this bracketing business, right? Because they come in edges in different ways. So you put them in, uh, in, the, in the L3 term. So you have like your three L2 terms from the three term of curves, put them in the L3 term. And that's the Jacobi identity. Okay? So the Jacobi identity guarantees that your count is invariant in the deformation of these uh, incidence conditions, which was known, but it's kind of really cool interpretation for it. Uh, my time is up. Um, the last thing I'm going to be saying is that A0 is also the kernel of delta, which is the BD operator. So it's a dual to the Durand differentiation. And this links it up with work uh, running from C. So that, that's it. Thanks for that. Some time talking about the, the quantum kind of uh, yes. topical case. So, do you think there's any way of uh, generating some sort of uh, quantum factorization out of this picture? Yes, we were hoping that um, the very naive way does not work. I think I'll just do the Q number um, in a higher dimensional thing. Um, because the quantum count is also somewhat related to the dimension two, is special because in dimension two, mm. you'll have a Kayla. Right. And so you need to keep that structure in high dimensions. You need to have some sort of um, pairing um, in high dimensions. And once you, you have that and you put that in the, in the picture, then you, then you can have cuneiform counts. And we're still more of pro proving that they do satisfy the property that if you plug a minus one, that they actually get the real count. But also real counts and uh, high dimensions are an issue, right? And it's well changed in that invariant are defined in dimension three, but on high dimension, yeah. But yeah, there, there should be something. Anyway, anyone? Anyone? Uh, you. How did you think of this? I mean, what is the motivation of <laughs> an infinity? I mean, how did you realize that there would be such a structure? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, uh, Travis and I have been thinking about this in parallel, and we both came up with the infinity. But just computation, somehow. Um, I don't know. He had, that was his idea to do this flow business. Um, and then, you know, the bracketing came naturally out of that idea of the flow business. And my motivation to help it was the other side running for conceivative work. Where, because this polyvector field DGLA, um, if you have a, a color BL, then the DGLA polyvector field is formal. Um, because it governs the duration field of the color BL, which is, is formal. And then there's a procedure worked by running for conceivative, suggested by them, where uh, you get solutions to the Maracatani equation for this DGLA um, by using some L infinity app. 
uh, cause isomorphism. It's a very cool, cool story. I was interested in that because I, I wanted to apply this to the Rosiva program and, and study that. And so I was coming at L infinity from that. And so I knew that this block polyvector fields had this L infinity structure. And I'm interested in that one. And so Travis comes up with this simultaneously, uh, the same thing. And I think there's a link, right? So this chop of a curve business, my, my vision is at some point, it will just enter the construction of the deformation of a collabial. And the numerative data will come into the D model uh, just with this L infinity cause isomorphism. That's why L infinity is important. And also, this is the work on a tropical vertex group. Right? Maybe you've seen that um, by Hande Pande, Ross and Dieter. Um, this is sort of like a group structure that encodes innovative uh, things in a fancy way. Mm -hmm. This L infinity operation is the generalized operation of the, the multiplication of the vertex group. This is the generalization of it. So we expect this structure to, um, uh, well, another thing I could say is, Mm. I said, you know, there's this procedure where you take a lock calabial and associate it to a ring, and the spec of that ring is the mirror. And what this L infinity stuff in polyvector field is about is a bit like you don't just get the ring of the mirror, you get the entire algebra of polyvector field of the mirror. Okay. Uh -huh. Which is also expected from the synthetic cohomology. So this is a. Uh, Um, so if any of the questions, I suggest not only that we thank Helga again, but also all the speakers of the week, and in particular the, the two organizers, Gustav and Julia, for what was really a great conference. Yeah. <laughs>